How are you? I'm good. How are you? You look pretty and I like your ribbons behind you and your hair's all done. Your lashes look good. Thank you. I, uh, you got dressed up for you guys. I changed out of my sweat outfit just for this live. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm so happy that you are here. Would have loved you with the sweat outfit or not. Um, I want to talk about a lot of really cool things with you. Just so you know, the, the, the beautiful faces that you see on the screen, uh, they are in the, the season where they are showing up, being visible, creating content, making offers, right? And um, you are a phenomenal podcaster. You're also a phenomenal businesswoman. You're also a mom. You're also a wife. You're also a daughter. And there's so much that you've come to know about creating a whole world, right? Where you have the courage to be visible. You have allowed in the, this level of ease where you now make seven figures in your business. And all of that is super exciting because we want to keep seeing a model of somebody who's kind and really into the balance of both family and also being a woman in the business space on your terms. Like you're not having to like go to an office all day. You're not having to sell your soul. You feel excited and you feel like you're thriving in so many ways. And so I'm so excited to kind of dive into all that. So that's my little intro of, 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 of what I think puts this into context, but thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you. I'm super excited. Yeah. I'm Jacqueline Snyder and I'm a, the product boss. So we do tend, we help physical product-based business owners. So, you know, there's so many podcasts and education out there for service-based companies. And so we saw this gap about six years ago that, you know, people were talking about building an email list and then they would say, um, you know, just create an opt-in, you know, do a download. And I was like, product people can't do that. So it was really something that, you know, we started, I started, I think when I was 37, I thought my career was what it was, which was in fashion design and, um, couldn't even believe that this is what it turned into. It was our Friday fun thing that we did. And then now it's, you know, I feel like I'm like, it's my legacy. It's like my, it's just, it's so much more than I could have ever even dreamed of. So I'm just, I'm so glad to be here. Well, let's pull it apart a little bit because we want to deconstruct it so we can learn from you. Yeah. So what did it begin with? Did it begin with you going live on Instagram? Did it begin with a few people coming over for tea and you teaching? Did it begin with a podcast? How did it begin? Yeah. So I actually, um, I have a business partner, uh, Mina Kunlositep, and she, we met through another podcaster's Facebook group for six figures, uh, female CEOs, um, actually at the biz chicks podcast. I don't know if you know, uh, Natalie Ekdahl. So I remember hearing Natalie mentioned Mina on the podcast saying she sells her product on Amazon. If, you know, she wanted to be an Amazon coach, she could be. And I had a physical product face business in fashion, like an accessories line. And I reached out to Mina in the Facebook group and I was like, Hey, you know, can I pick your brain about Amazon? So we went from online, like a, you know, a, Facebook thing to Voxer. And we just talked at each other like 15 minutes. Like that's the max, right? So it's like, we were destined to be podcasters because we could just talk. Um, and so really what we did is it, we, it was, it was interesting. Neither of us had audiences. Like I was really well known where I was. She had her great business. Um, and I was known in the LA fashion industry and we decided first to start with just a mastermind. So I would speak at events for the fashion industry and I had her come and we talked and I was like, let's sell something. I'm very much a quick start, very much a no idea what we're going to do, but let's just do it, <laughs> you know, try it. Let's try it. Let's see if we can make money. Um, and so after this event where we spoke, there was like 50 people in the room and I put flyers on everyone's uh, chairs and we're like, if you're interested in a mastermind, come meet us in the hallway. We were looking for like eight people. We closed 13 people in the hallway. Three thousand dollars. We were like PayPaling them on our phones. We had no idea that was what it was going to be, and it was incredible. And so that was really the first kind of soiree into me. Not only well, they were fashion people, but with a partner and doing things. And then we decided that was like in October, and then in January we launched the podcast. And we had no audience, so we just started a podcast. <laughs> this is in two thousand and eighteen. And we also thought we were so behind the ball with podcasts, right? We we're like, oh my God, Jenna Kutcher, like she's so, you know, we're so behind, like we're never going to make it out there, which we were not. And no one is behind the ball because it's all, it's just a growing industry. Um, yeah. So we did it with, with no audience, 
just started speaking into our microphones, editing it. And what was really interesting is by the 10th episode, we had um, been, been approached by CrateJoy, which is like a platform for subscription boxes. And I remember they were like, we want to sponsor the podcast. And we're like, well, we looked at like $25 per thousand people. You know, what do people pay? But I was like, there's no way we're going to do it for that. So we actually just kind of created a five-part series for them, charged them $10,000. And that was like the very first thing we did monetizing with no audience. And that was just, that was the beginning of it all. I love this story. Type of one in the chat. If this feels really exciting and fun to hear these words, you know, it's one thing for me to say it, but for you to hear it again and again from someone who's lived it, it's like, oh my gosh, what a cool possibility that somebody started this in 2018 and then was able to feel like they really got it off the ground. And I love the quick start. That's definitely who I am. I know that not everybody's nervous system can handle just starting, but boy, is there so much reward in just diving in and you learn while it's messy. And uh, I feel like a lot of really successful people adopt the quick start, just like, just jump it, just try it. (laughs) So you started and then did the podcast become sort of the fuel to grow mm-hmm. the business? And if so, why? Um, Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we started an Instagram account, also felt like we were so behind on that, right? Everything just, you always feel like you're behind. Oh, I missed the boat on that. You know, sure. I missed the boat on that. So um, the podcast was absolutely the thing where it just kind of organically started growing. And to be honest, we never took on sponsors until this last year we signed with HubSpot Podcast Network. So that's that's the only ad we've ever run other than our own. So it was really interesting because we just kind of watched the numbers grow. And what we did do though, is we, you know, we got on other podcasts. So that was our reach too, right? We were able to get on other people's podcasts and do podcast swaps. And we kind of just did it. Um, so that was our first thing. And we were just selling masterminds, you know, that was really, cause again, it was our Friday hobby and we like the money we made, we were like, we're going to go see each other somewhere in the country. You know, that was kind of the only thing we wanted from it. And I, you know, I think it grew because one we're we were authentic like we didn't fake who we are, who we are. There's no way I can fake who I am. I'm just, I am who I am. Um, I always used to, you know, remember, um, answering machines and you listen to your voice and I was like, Oh, my, my Valley girl voice, but it didn't matter. You know, there's an audience for everybody. And if they like you, they like you and they're going to listen. And if they don't, they're going to move on. So it was really great because that sort of, and it still is our top of funnel, the way we reach the most people, the way we impact the most people. And it's a connect, like we're very connected, we're authentic. And I think that they see that. And we always get comments from people saying, you know, it feels like we're sitting down to lunch with our friends talking business. Yes. You know, so it's not intimidating. We don't talk about business in an intimidating way. Right, right. I love that. And I just want to just circle one of the things you said, like it's top of funnel. So just so everybody kind of is on the same page with that. When we look at business, we talk about like a customer journey, right? We talk about the, from the first moment they become aware of you, how they then go on the journey, right? As a customer. And so when we say top of funnel, it's like, oh, this is how we bring people inside of the customer journey. This is where they start. And from there, we're able to engage them and make it feel, you know, enough of of intrigue is built there that they then opt into something. And eventually that becomes enough of a engine to grow the business, it grows. So that's where the funnel is beginning, right? So in every business, you look at like, what is top of funnel, right? For some people, it used to be like, I remember when they would have promoters out on the streets of New York and LA giving postcards away to tell people about a band that was performing at a certain place. Like that was the top of their funnel. Maybe enough people actually show up at the show and then they get interested and then they buy the single and then those people become fans, right? Everybody has like a top of funnel. And how awesome that for a lot of us, the podcast, which is something that feels very second nature, you're just like chatting, that that can become the top of funnel. So for you, Jackie, to go further from that, what happens once people come into the podcast, they, they like you because you and me are very like girl next door vibes. And then what do you give them? What's the freebie or what's the next thing that they get to take a bite out of that leads them towards 
being in your world in a deeper way. Yeah. So, you know, when we first started, we actually had a Facebook group. So we, we had communities so we're like opt into our Facebook group. We don't have that anymore. Um, but we have a resource guide, for example, or if we're talking about something very specific on the podcast as an opt-in, um, could we be better at it? Yes, we could. <laughs> Cause you know, we also run ads. So I think we went a lot into the ads part versus the organic, which we're getting back into that. So really, I think it's something creating something of value. So whatever the episode's about, can you create something of value that then pulls them into the email list? Because then the second thing that we do is we nurture the heck out of them in the email. Welcome. And the very first thing, this is like a great tip. It, you know, a lot of times you'll get welcome emails and it's like, welcome with a whole long email. Um, ours is, Hey, welcome. What do you sell? It's just super simple one sentence and they reply. And that is the thing that makes your email, your email system and their email system friends, right? We don't end up in promotions. We don't end up in spam. We don't have to respond to everybody, but it starts to get them to engage with us. Like, Hey, this is a real person we're talking to. And then obviously there's a funnel, not a funnel, um, an email sequence. It's like, here's some podcast episodes. These are our best podcast episodes you might want to hear about, or here's about the hosts. And then we don't sell to them for a long time because we need to nurture. We need to bring them in. Um, but also always being helpful. Also our Instagram presence is another place that they'll come to you. Right. So we'll say, Hey, come follow us over here. So then they're not only hearing us, they're visually seeing us and they're engaging and we try and be funny. I think we think we're funny <laughs> when we're like, some people think we're funny. So then, you know, they get to, if they're into us, they're into us and they're going to stay. And if they're not, that's okay too right? That's okay. They won't listen or maybe they will listen, but they won't open the emails. And we're okay with that because as long as we're kind of meeting them in different arenas, we're at least somewhere in their mind. I just took notes. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, that was so helpful. It is so clear. It makes so much sense what you just said. And you guys, as exhausting as it can feel when you're learning something new, if you set that up once you're done, like if you take the, take the time to set that up one time, even if you do it in a messy way, even if you do it in a really basic way, you can keep improving it. But that one thoughtful sequence that you set up is so cool. And so you can think about for yourself, depending on what your content is about, what would be the question you would ask? Would you ask somebody like, what's the one self-care thing that you do? You know, would you ask somebody, um, who is your go-to person, you know, who you can tell everything to, or I don't know what your topic is. Do your kids, do your baby sleep through the night? How many hours of sleep do you get? Six, four, tell me, right? Like get them to respond. That is so great. Um, you guys can tell as we start to talk more and more to Jacqueline that she is a great coach, right? This is why she's helped people to learn how to make a living doing the thing that feels really fun and from home, right? And getting to do this stuff from home. So um, let's go further because we gave everybody in our podcast course a challenge to make an offer. And some of them have been making offers for years and some of them are brand new to it. And it feels so scary when that moment comes. It's one thing to like think about things, but then doing them feels like, oh my God, I feel like so much imposter syndrome to tell someone, here's what I can give you in exchange for money. Like I'm going to ask you for money to do something. I feel like crawling under a rock. I know that you have worked with thousands of women at this point, And I know that they've probably had that same feeling. So let's talk about that. How do you, how do you think women in general can best move through that really yucky feeling of imposter syndrome and being, being paid for things? What comes up for you there? Yeah. So it actually reminds me of when I started my first business, my fashion consulting business designer consulting co-op, I was 26. I knew nothing. I was a 26 year old, right? I just, I was working in the fashion industry. I worked for someone who was just cruel and I was like, I need to get out. And I was interviewing for other people, um, like for bigger jobs. And then I had a friend that was like, Hey, come help me. And then we decided to consult people. I, you know, I remember like, 26, 27, 28, 29. I was like, I don't actually know what I'm doing here, but these people are paying me. Right. And I was like, all right. They always say fake it till you make it. But I knew more than they knew. I knew something that was more specialized than the people who wanted to hire me. I knew how to design. I knew how to, you know, create apparel, like production development, all the things. 
So I just kept having to stay focused on, I know how to do this one special thing and they don't know how to do it. And that's why they're paying me. Right. I remember $60 an hour and I would like track all my, like (laughs) all my numbers. Like I was a lawyer. I was imagining I was a lawyer. Um, and you know, eventually I remember, you know, I'm 10 and a half years into that business and I have a client paying me $10,000 a month, a man, cause I didn't had a lot of female clients, but it was a man. I remember saying to him, like, you know, I just wish I had a business partner that knew more about business. I don't feel like I know anything about business. And this guy looks at me and he's like, I'm paying you $10,000 a month because you know a lot about business. And it was just like this one reality check that I was like, oh, you're right. You know, I've been an entrepreneur for over a decade. So I think what happens is we we have the self-doubt and we think we need to know more or do more, right? But it is kind of the way you get started and you do, you do it messy. Nobody cares. Like nobody cares as much as you care. And no one's paying attention enough right? You can send an email to a hundred thousand people. You could have crickets in the response of the offer. Nobody knows that it bombed. You could change your messaging and you can do it again. So people don't know. We think, we think everybody knows if sales go well or promotions go well or whatever, but they don't know. You just have to come out from a place. So I think, I think, you know, my 26 year old self would say, fake it till you make it right. Just do, just do it. As Nike says, um, I think the other side of it is, is, and we deal with this a lot in our community is people want to sell their products, but they don't want to feel salesy. They always say, I don't want to be salesy. They don't want to sell to people. And I'm like, what if what you have is solving a problem, meeting a need, want, or desire? We all have something to offer people that is going to create a solution for them for a pain point in their life. So it's not salesy. I joke. I'm like, you're not the guy with like the watches in the code in New York city. That's like, buy my watches, right? No, we're not doing sleazy sales. We're do- making offers that are authentic and connected because you're connected with your community. You saw a pain point. That's why you started whatever business you started. So I think you do it messy. You just get started. You make the offer. It's okay if you fail. We failed. We have like 5 million downloads. We're a top podcast. There are things that we've sent out in the last year that have just crickets. But nobody knows that until I just said it now, nobody knows what bombed and that's okay. And then we pivoted and then we're like, okay, maybe this works better. So it's really, and again, in the product world too, I'm like, test and try, test and try. Um, You know, was it Edison, Thomas Edison that said like, you know, I failed 10,000 times until the one time that it worked. And so I think just to feel feel that way. And if you feel like you don't know anything, it's okay. Like you, you're in this with Kathy. She's a genius, right? And look at what she's done with her life. So like, you know enough to be coached or be in rooms with really smart women, to listen to podcasts, to get the education you need. And that's more than the majority of the world. The majority of the people are working for people. You all are trying to create something really cool. That is so, it's 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 like Mary Poppins giving you like medicine. Like it's, it's a spoonful of sugar. I just feel like everything you just said and this is why you're a great podcaster. There's something about you that's just very real and like, there's no errors, there's no pretenses. And then when you talk, everyone's like, she's right. She's right. Like, and it's just like, it's, it's sensible. It's sensible. And the funny thing is I like laughed when you're like, you're, she's a genius. It's like, I hesitated to start a podcast course when I'm trying to think Emma would remember when we first launched this, we launched it, I think five years ago. Um, I've had the podcast for almost seven, this January seven. I remember thinking, who am I to start a podcast course? At that point, we had like, you know, maybe 3 million downloads or something. And people asked me a lot, right? Because friends of mine were like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I should do that. I should do that. And then I remember like, who am I to start this? And before that, when I was a songwriter full-time and I started a songwriting workshop, I was like, my God, there's so many more successful songwriters. Like, why would I do this? I don't know anything. Honestly, that's really what I thought. And I sat on that idea for a year. And when I first started writing music, I would not even show people my songs. I was like, these are terrible. Like compared to what I hear on the radio, these are so bad. And then I like had the courage to show someone a song. And I remember he was a publisher at Geffen Music. He was a friend of a friend and he was willing to listen. He's like, this sounds like Ricky Lee Jones. That's what he said to me. And I was like, it does. I think it's so dumb. And he's like, it's so melodic and good. And he's like, this would work really well for film and TV because pop music now is so big, but TV music is, there's more room for this. And I was like, really? And he's like, send it out. I'm like, okay. And like, 
I'm not joking. Like with everything I've ever done, I think it's awful. I think it's awful to mediocre, like best mediocre. Even now I'm like, I guess I'm nice enough. They kind of hang out. I'm I'm not joking. Like, it's amazing to me. My book was just submitted and like, oh my God, it needs to be rewritten. This is the way our minds work. But what you just said is actually the truth. You do know things. You do. You do know things. And, and, and other people are a part of the dance. They're a part of what creates their own experience. The client has to show up. It's a it's a partnership, right? Like you go to the restaurant, you have to order something you're not allergic to. You have to make sure you eat it and don't wait 40 minutes to start eating because it got cold. Like I'm saying like the client has to be part of the conversation. If people come to my class and say, I didn't get anything out of it, usually it's because they didn't come to the class, right? And that's not my fault. Like I have no control over them. They're adults. So in that way, it's like, why would we continue to let that stand in our way? That doesn't make sense, right? It really doesn't. And you're right. You're not the guy with the toothbrushes standing there on Fifth Avenue. You're not, you're nothing like that person. And you know that, but that's the feeling that we have. And also when we're born, we grow up, we're looking at these people that are bigger than us, your parents, right? And you're like, want to be picked up and they're really tall and you're really small. And so you develop a habit where other people know better than you. And you develop a habit where you think that you are not measuring up and you want to, you, you're trying, you know, to, to feel a little bit of a sense of dominion over yourself, but there's this old programming, which everybody seems to have, because we all started out small physically small, you know, and everybody was bigger and everybody told us what to do. And then you go, wait a minute, the leaders of this world, they, they make their own decisions and opinions. They don't ask everybody. They don't second guess themselves all the time. Oh, cause at some point we have to stop thinking that everybody knows better than us. So let's go further because I think that that was so helpful and that really like clears the deck in a lot of ways, but then there's this feeling of over responsibility. I feel like when somebody actually gets paid where they're like, okay, I made it through the imposter syndrome enough to like start, but now I'm getting paid. And now I don't know how to grow this because I feel like I have to be the everything to my client. So then how could I scale or how can I charge more in order for this to flourish and thrive? And so when it comes to being paid, well, when it comes to really making money, What do you think is the unlock where women can just set it all down and just let themselves be rich doing what they love? Because it's a big leap. Yeah. I love this question. So I've been really thinking about the glass ceiling, right? We all talk that uh, Shonda Rhimes book, you know, year of yes. She talks about the glass ceiling and how all these women that came before us have like put cracks in that glass ceiling. Okay. So we've got Shonda Rhimes and like Oprah Winfrey level glass ceiling. Okay. Then there's all of us. And if we work for somebody else, they're setting the ceiling for us. But what's bonkers to me is when we have our own businesses, the level that we set our own glass ceilings at. And I think that's the thing that's nuts, right? Because we're keeping like, we're keeping caps on ourselves. We're like, maybe this is Shonda Rhimes up here, right? Maybe this is your employers here. And then ours is like all the way down here. We don't even value ourselves enough. Like we work for someone else. We're like, they need to pay us more. Like guys get paid more than us, you know? And then we <laughs> we do it to ourselves because we don't believe that we are capable of it or we don't have enough role models to show us this, right? We see very famous people, but who, who are like Kathy said, are moms living their lives that need to change scheduling with their whole group because she needs to go do a mom thing tomorrow, Right. Same over here. My daughter's homesick today, right? And so there's this this level of like, what are our, what is our capacity? And so what I'd love us all to do is like lift the glass ceiling for ourselves because, and Kathy, this is at your house. We had had a discussion about this feeling with my business partner and I that we almost were butterflies with cups put on top of ourselves, that we were each putting a lid on top of what our potential could be because we've started diverging in what we want to do in this business and that's okay. 
And I just remember thinking like, I will die if someone keeps a cup because I don't know where I'm going to go. I never even thought I would make a million dollars in my business in a year, but at least I believe in the potential, like the blue sky. I could just look up and be like, anything is possible. Nobody's telling me something's not possible. I am very grateful and lucky that my family that I was raised in, everything was possible. First generation American over here. They came here, they figured it out. So it was like kind of, it was truly the American dream versus other people who grew up and it's like, nope. Don't think that big. Who are you to think that way? How are, you know, like, who do you think you are? Right. Feeling judgment. So I think first lift that glass ceiling. You don't have to worry about where the next ceiling is. Just look to the blue sky and just imagine what if anything was possible? I love to switch it to a question versus like a statement. So I think that's one of the biggest things that I've done for myself that I always just believe that there could just be more. I don't know what I'll hit. I don't even know what I want to do, but I mean, I do know what I want to do, but I don't know what it's going to look like. And then I think um, I'm trying to like make sure I'm answering the question. Am I getting here for what you want? It's just <laughs> I, like, phenomenal. Lost it. No, okay. you, you didn't. I mean, it's phenomenal. I, I I think that that says it in such a beautiful way. It's so much. It's like poetry. It's so much poetry when you say that idea of the butterfly with the gl- the glass on top of it. It's such a perfect illu- you know illustration of it. And I love this concept that there's been a glass ceiling placed on us, but why would you place it on yourself? That makes no sense. And looking to the blue sky is so beautiful. Like really, you know, like how much bigger are you willing to see possibility and stop arguing for what's not possible because that is such a waste of time. And so it is awesome, you know, that you had this model of your parents coming to the country, the first, first of their, you know, first of their families and starting with nothing and and building something, which really does give you this palpable, like you can taste it. Like we can, if we say we can, right. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is that quote is like, if you say you can't, or you say you can, you're right. It's what you believe, right? So when you just said that, you're like, yeah, I make a million dollars in my business. I mean, that's amazing. And so when your daughter's homesick today, you can create a life where you can be there if you want to. Why should we have to, if thoughts become things, why do we have to have the thought that in order for us to make money, we have to suffer, sacrifice, not be home? Why, 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 why? Why not work smarter rather than harder? And have the thought that you're going to make money doing what you love and you're going to reverse engineer that plan and you're going to make it on your terms, right? So um, what what comes to mind if I say to you, you know, over the years, the thousands of women that you coached, what's the biggest mistake they make over and over again that you would love to like whisper in their ear? Like, this will really help if you do this instead of that. Like, what is one of the, sort of reoccurring pitfalls that you see people like hold themselves back from their, their dreams. Well, one, I think is just being audacious to dream big, right? We hit a million dollars, our first million dollars in 2020, which was, we were like, where there's no way we were going to do this. And somehow we did it in 10 months right now. We're multi seven. And my goal is 10 million, right? Who I told my, my, my husband told before we ever hit like three or 4 million or something, my husband told his grandpa who was always in business, you know, he's like 93. And um, said, you know, Jacqueline has a goal of like hitting like three, $3 million this year. He's like, well, she needs to be reasonable. He's like, grandpa, like she is reasonable. He's a loving, lovely guy. Right. But he's like, she is reasonable. Like this is not be reasonable. Like she's, you know, heaven forbid, they all knew that I like 10 million was an, an initial, like a very short term goal. So you know, I think, and these numbers are crazy because I, one thing I think that we did is we all talked about getting to becoming like a six figure product or a six figure business. That was like the thing that was kind of trending for a long time. I just want to hit six figures. And then we skipped all the way to seven figures. There was no in between. There was no, like, I'm going to be a quarter million dollar business, right? It was just like jump all the way to a million. It doesn't matter. I think my first thing is, is like the revenue is the revenue and you could do it with ease and you can, it's your business. You can do it however you want. And you have your foot on the gas pedal. So don't get scared about the thing that you think is going to happen when you grow, because you'll have the tools, you'll have the resources when you do start to blow up. And if you don't, you're going to figure it out because you're going to hopefully start making money. You're going to have all the things. So, so many times, you know, our students are like, 
I don't, I don't want to grow like, because they're makers and they're like, I'm going to be buried in balls of yarn. I'm like it, you can hire someone. So I think one thinking that you can hire when you're ready, we, um, we don't know how to raise, you know, I've got an eight-year-old. I've never raised an eight-year-old girl before. When I got the eight-year-old girl, I had to figure it out. Right. And then you have a 17 year old girl and you'll have to figure it out then. So you figure it out in the moment and we're women, we can do this. The other thing, um, the other thing that I think for so many people is the, the, I call BS on balance and on juggling because juggling something's going to fall or something's up in the air as women, as moms, as people who are caretakers and needing to be multifaceted. So, and then balance is kind of like a fake too, because if you're balancing, it's like, well, what's keeping it level. So I really like to talk about the blend, right? I really think we have to think more of our lives or more of our days about like a blend, like a smoothie. So tomorrow Kathy's blend is going to be that she's more mom Mm -hmm. in the recipe than like work in the recipe. Um, So it's thinking about like, what is the ingredient for the day that it needs to happen? And we could blend it all together. And sometimes it's heavier on one thing and sometimes it's heavier in another. I really like visuals for me a lot of times. So I'd rather us think, start to think about no juggling, no balancing, thinking, how do I just blend all of this together? And sometimes it'll be messy. And sometimes you forget to put the lid on and it splatters all over the place. Okay, fine. We'll clean it up. Right. And other times it's like, ah, this is perfect. I like, I rocked my smoothie today. And then there's everything in between. I love that. That feels so good to me. I, uh, I've never heard the the blend or the smoothie analogy, but it feels right. It, it's the <laughs> truth. It's like some days there's more banana some days, are, but there's never like this perfect, like, yeah, it's, it's harmonious is equal amounts, this and equal amounts that. And this is where we make great the enemy of good. Cause when you tell yourself something that your brain doesn't believe, you won't see the evidence of what the next step is, right? So that's why it's important to tell yourself something that you do believe like, nope, no balance over here. But what I can do is I could blend this together and I could have fun with that and I can make that interesting. And that feels true. And then you're like, all right, so let's let's just sit with that. You know, it's, it's the same way that you can, I think, um, have better results in your business when you say, I am not everyone's person. Cool. Like, let's go. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just the freedom to stop trying to convince yourself of what's not true is so helpful. Like everyone needs to buy from me. It's like, no, some people are not going to like it no matter what you do. It's like, cool. Now I got this. Like you go in with the knowing that you don't have to take on something that's too, too much to be true because it's too much. It's not true. Tell yourself the truth. Not everyone's going to like me. I don't have to get everybody on board. Not everybody wants what I'm selling. Not everybody wants to pay, but there's a buyer at every price. The value is the value. Some people will see this as valuable and they will buy it and I'll be their person. Great. Let's go wheels up. Mm -hmm. So um, I love, love it. I want you guys to take a second and put questions in the comments in the chat. I can ask, I can ask Jacqueline some of your questions. And then, um, we will, we will go from there, but while they're doing that, um, what is your current dream? Like, I know that you and I talk behind the scenes and this is what I think is really juicy. Um, Jill Stanton was just here and we had a conversation about her, like in real life experience of things. And it was so helpful and cool. What for you is something you've learned recently that's a little bit challenging that you've learned from it? You're leading your way through it. And what is the the next sort of dream on the on the on the leaderboard for you? Jill has been actually such an impactful person in my life too. Just so we, you know, you listen to Jill and you're like, yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, so you you kind of mentioned it earlier about like um resourcing other people right? Mm-hmm. Talking to lots of people, getting feedback. And I've been in a partnership for the last six years with someone who was my biz bestie, feels like family. And we're sort of transitioning. You're kind of first to hear it here, um, that it will be fully me at the product boss. And what I forgot about myself was that, at, like I said, at 26, I started a business. My friends were all working for other people. 
I started a business and I didn't have, there were no masterminds or podcasts in 2004. You know, when I started this thing, it was, it was me figuring it all out and I didn't have people to resource. So I kind of just did what I did. I didn't have coaches, none of it. Maybe one colleague who worked down the hall at the office building I was at. So I forgot to trust myself. I forgot that like, I have a gut feeling, don't always have to resource and ask other people, but in partnership you do, right? Like there's this level of like needing to pass through things through filters. And in this transition out of partnership into solo, it's, it's starting to trust my gut again, right? This is me. This is my business. This is my life. I go to sleep with the bills, right? I wake up with the bills. So I got to figure it out and it's my life to live. And that's why I started a business was so I can kind of decide what kind of life I want to live and who I want to work with and all the things. So, and we're all, we're still friends. We love each other, all the things, but it's just, I'm going to be transitioning to fully being the host of the product boss. So I really been, you know, my husband said like, you know, I'm in a chrysalis and he's like, you know, the caterpillar turns into mush, which I've been, and I feel like I'm coming out of the mush. Um, I feel like I'm getting more clarity, but I also know I was in um, Italy in like the Dodges Palace in Venice. You looked so amazing there. You were like glowing and I'm looking at all your scenery. I'm like, I love that you just went to Italy. Yeah, I took and I was able to pay for my mom and my whole family. And we did a first class thing. This was like the goal I really wanted to do. This was like a big thing I want to do for my family. But And your mom just survived a really serious illness. She's, I mean, she's got stage four cancer. So she's, but she's in a good place right now. So we're definitely like, you know, we're trying to live our life in the day. Cause when someone, you know, is sick, there's not, we don't know what days we have. So it's like, let's just live in our day. So I think there's that being in the moment. And then when I was in this Dodge's palace, I was like, oh, he had his like conciliary, you know, like everyone always has like their people, like there's the people around the Kings and the mayors and everything totally. like that. And I was, so I was like, I can still resource people, but in the end, what does my gut tell me? What am I most aligned with and what works the best? Because I have to think about, because I am the leader, I am the visionary. So I think it's kind of like trying to re, for me, it's getting back into who I am at this stage of my life with a business of this size that I've never been in this position before. So I'm just kind of figuring it out, but that's okay. Right. That was very generous for you to take us through that Um, type of one in the chat. If you want to give her some love for sharing so vulnerably. And I think it's really important. I think it's also something that we all can relate to that. It feels scary to make a change, especially when the change is around support. And also it is uncanny how our gut always knows what our alignment is. It's just the courage to choose it. And when we get good at having the courage to choose our alignment, there's a lot more ease when we are willing to say, wow, this is inconvenient that my gut is telling me that this is no longer my alignment, whether it's having a certain relationship or it's um, having a, a a certain role in a relationship or having, um, a certain price that you've been selling, like, but your gut is very clear with you. So when people tell me a lot of times, I don't know what to do. I go, no, you know what to do. I don't know is usually I'm scared. Mm -hmm. It's I'm scared to know what I know because I don't want to throw a grenade into this because it feels like safety because our brain registers familiarity as safety. Well, that's very tough because life is ever changing because you, me, we're all growing all the time. And so we have this push pull of like, let's keep it the same because the brain thinks that will be safer And then your soul's like, no, no, we got to move. Like we got to grow out of this shell. We got to move. So as a business owner, as a wife, as a mom, as a person, if we could really get that lesson, I mean, this is why in Buddhism, as a, for instance, I mean, I'm Jewish and I still love a lot of things from a lot of different wisdom traditions. One of the things in Buddhism is this like 
really clear focus on change is the only constant. Yes. And so why they do well in certain regards is because the there's a non-attachment. They're not attached to it needing to be the same because they are always prepping their nervous system for the fact that change is part of the landscape all the time. And therefore you can lean into what you know to be true in every moment. And it, it sometimes means I have to have a hard conversation with my partner and you can see it from her face and her glow. They're okay. Cause they're loving and mature and they approached it with love and maturity. And so everyone gets to choose their alignment. And we, we've recently on my team's team's team made some changes. And that was also like very, ooh, just very intense for me. And some of you know that in, I talked about it a little bit on a live and a little bit on a podcast and a little bit with Jill on that conversation. But in May, I said to my husband, I was like, whatever this relationship is, I'm breaking up with it. This relationship and this dynamic, I'm breaking up with it. And I was just at a point where like, that was what was. And now I don't even recognize it. I was driving home from dropping my kids off from school going, I can't believe I'm going back home. And like the energy between us and everything's different. Everything's different. He's going on a trip next week, which to do a writer's boot camp with Adam Carolla. He's going with a bunch of men to Jerusalem in November. He's having his 50th birthday. He's writing a script. He's, uh, He's taken it on himself to like, want to do a lot of things around the house. He went back to work. He's happier. Like, I mean, everything's different. I, I, I list everything's different. And um, by the way, as an aside, him going back to work was the changer because it turned out that my big uh, genius idea that I would make enough money that he didn't have to work anymore was the dumbest thing because he stopped feeling good about himself which meant I stopped respecting a person who's not in flow. He was sitting around and feeling emasculated that he had agreed to sit around because I was like, you don't need to work. I make all this money. It's like, what vibe is that? (laughs) So then I'd come in the living room and go, what'd you do today? And he's like, nothing. I did nothing. And I'm like, Oh my God. (laughs) It's the conversation I literally just had yesterday. (laughs) So I was like, I'm breaking up with it. It's over. And I thought it was over. I thought we had both served each other and beautiful. No, he was like, what if I just go back to work? And I was like, try it. And it's just like, from there, he had all this energy starts working out. So it's like, it's just like, he's back to life. Cause it's not about money. It's not about how much money he made. And I used to be like, why would you make that kind of money? I can make this money. You should just do laundry. It's like, oh my God. I, I, it's just about well being, is what it is. And he has a brain. He went to law school. He wants to use his brain. Also, he's not an entrepreneur. Not everyone is. Like, we all sit around each other and we're like, this is amazing. And other people are like, I would never create content. I would never, and like, stop making me you. So I learned a lot, you guys. But the point being that it was uncomfortable for me to have to sit with, it's time to make some big changes. And it's, it's time for me to like, I don't know what's on the other side of that. That's the thing. See, the thing is that right now we can talk about it and there's a lot more peace in inside of your nervous system because you're on this side. The courage, the courage that you get the credit for is you did not know. You did not know. That's the thing. There is the unknown of what's going to happen with this partnership. How will we be as friends? How will we treat each other? How will this go down logistically? And that is what we all get the most credit for in our whole lives. I didn't know when I said this to him in May, I didn't know that this would be the outcome. It was scary. And I was like, but this has to stop and no one's going to raise their hand to do it. So I'm doing it. And it it propelled a lot of beauty. And now he sees that this is good, but neither of us would want to go through that again. But my point is that that kind of courage is going to be needed again and again and again. Like from now until the time that you're 98, there's going to be six six other things that you're going to have to show up and be willing to change. And if you can do that, oh my gosh, you can live an exhilarating life that's so much more fulfilling, but it's going to require rupture and repair and rupture and repair. And they say, by the way, that's what makes relationships stronger is being willing to like be authentic. Sometimes that creates a rupture, right? So 
this, there's so much to this conversation. I want to ask you a few questions. Jackie, do you have like 10 more minutes? Yeah, I know your daughter's home. For it. Yeah, no, but- no, no. But my husband's home too. So, right. <laughs> but I, <laughs> my husband's an actor. So I resonate so deeply. There's been a writer's strike. So I resonate so deeply with everything you're saying. Right and he's so now. handsome, by the way, and adorable. And he goes on his Instagram and sings songs. <laughs> yes. I'm like, you have the husband that like every girl was in love with in high school. And then I eye rolled him and he's like, that's why I picked you. Cause he would like recite Shakespeare to me. And I'd be like, oh, this is so lame. And that my friends be like, oh my God. So, <laughs> you know, I didn't buy into it, but I did buy into it. So, um, yeah, I so saw, answer questions. Uh, okay. I'm just going to go in no particular order. Cause they came really quickly, but how do you address negative, hateful comments on your platforms? Do you delete them? Do you ignore them? So, you know, there's been a lot of that call out culture and, and one of the scariest things about growing visibly and creating an audience is also the vulnerability of people can just, you know, whatever day they're having, if you do something, they can come, they can come at you. So fortunately we haven't had a lot of people that are mad. We, we definitely try, but I actually recently, we were sending a lot of emails. So let's go back to emails. Everyone, this one was like, every time somebody unsubscribes, I feel like I'm going to die. I'm like, well, I would die a hundred times. I send an email because really? I lose like at least a hundred people. I sent out an email about supporting the small businesses of Maui because they need people to come back. They need people to shop. Sure. I got the meanest email back from somebody <laughs> saying, unsubscribe me. Like she called me a very mean thing that you call women. She actually called us. And she's like, I don't know why you keep sending emails. And I was like, the Maui email is the one you had to yell at me about. Like yell at me about the one where I was pitching you our course. Like this, this is the one that everyone's going to be like, oh, that's so lovely. So, you know, that one, we kind of chuckled. Sometimes we have like to our team, we have like love notes. We'll send the positive stuff to each other and be like, look at this response from this person. Like, look at these amazing things. So I think lean into that. And if anyone, of course, if anyone is disrespecting you, on social media publicly, I would immediately delete them, block them and block all future accounts. You don't need that in your world. Like there's all these keyboard warriors, like it's irrelevant. You're not going to lose anyone. I would just, you know, get rid of them. I agree. And I think it's so fascinating when we hold up an example like that, because who in their right mind, their right mind would call someone that word. We, we, we kind of know what that word is for any reason, let alone for any email, like that says so much about that person's state of mind is what that is. And so what I always do is I kind of, again, I don't try to convince myself that everybody's in the right frame of mind or that everybody is like, you know, mentally well and sound. So what I do is I'm just like, there's probably going to be some people who are really reactive And then I just let them be triggered, right? I don't kind of like make that about me. And then I will, if it's a, uh, you know, if it's, I'll unsubscribe them, if it's like that, or if it's on social media, I'll just be like block, you know, like, and at the same time, because I'm holding both things at the same time, I really want to grow and I really don't need myself to be perfect. So if I saw three of those comments and it was about like that, I talk too fast, or it's about that you know, something that I'm sending is off-putting, then I would go, thank you for the feedback. Even if they were reactive, I'd still try to find the gem Mm -hmm. because there's, there's a really cool way that the universe tells you very often what's not working. Right. We get podcast reviews, right. And like some of them are great and some of them aren't. And so it's the idea of like, okay, exactly what you said. We had one that was like, we got a couple of the same ones. I was like, oh, we need to shift that. Right. It's really bugging people, you know? It is here's what it a, is. Here's a question by someone with your same name, spelled differently, Jacqueline. Um, she said, how do you handle when you're trying your hardest to engage with your community, but no one responds, no matter how genuine you're trying to be. It makes me feel like the more I try, the less they want to engage. So I, I asked that question because I think engagement is super important. And I'm curious, like what what's worked for you with engagement? And what do you do if at first it doesn't feel like anyone's like biting? Like, what do you do? Yeah, so I feel this way about my email list right now. We have a big email list and I'm like, it feels like crickets and, and what used to work doesn't feel like it's working anymore. Right. So I think the thing is, is that no matter what in our industry and in any industry and in business, we're always pivoting and shifting and thinking about what's new and what to do. So what I decided I was like, this is, and this is the shift in the partnership is we took away a lot. We showed up for them more than we've ever shown up for anyone in 2020. 
And then we all got tired. We all did so much then. And then we got tired. And we're like, when are we going to come out of this? And so we kind of pulled back. And what I've decided to do is lean back in and create more and more value. So one little thing that we just decided to do is one of the biggest things for our community is that they need to make money selling their products and they don't believe they can. They need quick wins. So I'm doing these money tips once a week now on, I'm like on a Tuesday, I'm like, here's how you're going to make money this weekend. Try it out, respond on Monday. So I'm trying to engage the list by just serving them something, no sales. And then we remind them on a Friday, go through the weekend and then we're getting responses and it's working for people. And now we're adding it onto the podcast as an extra episode. And so we're just trying to serve more than sell more. And I think you have to just think, okay, well, where's, so my email list feels a little bit dead. So I need to re-engage it and then not think about all the past stuff, but then how do all the new people that I acquire, how do I figure that out? I think there's nothing stronger than like live helpfulness, but it's also multi-channel. So don't just go live on Instagram and think everyone's sitting on their phone waiting for you to go live, send an email and say, Hey, I'm going live today at X time, send a text message. Like we've had really good show up rates lately. Show up rates are like how many people come because we're we're sending more reminders than we've ever sent before. People have left their houses. They're not in front of their computers anymore. So I think it's just thinking about it as multi-channel or really we're moving in an omni-channel world where it's not individual channels that we're only reaching people on an individual thing. This is for selling. This is for um, media. It's like it's all the different ways that we have to let them know we're going to be here, come, but it's omni-channel. So just thinking about all the ways to interact. And then the thing that starts to work, keep doing that. But again, it's going back to that test and try. I love that. And I just want to say as a uh, news update, breaking news that people are self-involved oh. <laughs> and we all are like, if you look at the brain, if you like opened up the brain and looked at it your brain thinks a lot about itself. It's, it's survival. It's called, how am I going to eat today? How am I going to stay alive? How am I going to be safe? What do I need? So it's like, that's where your attention is going. It's like, okay, I want to make sure that that trip happens. I want to make sure that I have the couch. So I'm more comfortable. So my living room is prettier. The point being that you also are wired this way where it needs to be about you in order for you to open it, in order for you to want it. So that's why I talk about him all the time, but he says in this book that successful business is radical empathy. It's making it about them. So you have to ask yourself, like, what is in it for them? What is in it for them? What is in it for them? So when you go to post something, forget what you could post. You could post a million things. What do they need right now? What do they want right now? And once people really get involved in anything, in any brand, in any travel, in any, in anything that they do, they will explore things they didn't know that they wanted. They'll find a hole in the wall shop in Maui that has the best fish tacos, but they don't know that they want that right now. They want you to sell them the perfect beach with the perfect margarita, with the perfect bathing suit, with the perfect bot. Like you have to speak in their way. So it's important to start to think about who are your people? What are their biggest pain points? And what are the things that are the juiciest things for them? Because that's you too. That's why you're wired the way you are. For instance, when we do our next boot camp, which you guys will be, you, you might attend it. You might just be aware of it. You might watch it and take notes from it. You have no obligation to show up for it, but I'm just letting you know when we do our next boot camp, we don't just say like, it's three days, come and join me. We tell them explicitly what they learn each of the days, right? So that there's like, oh, I do want to, so day one is discovering your unique gift, right? Well, a lot of people are like, I, I, I want that. I don't know what my talent is. I don't know what my gift Day two is how do you monetize your passion? And then I talk a lot about what are the different ways you can do that. And then day three, we talk about like, how do you make abundance out of getting paid to be yourself fully? Like, how do you fully thrive in that? So there's a reason for that, right? There's a reason for for that. And so I love what Jackie just said, because it's like, we need to constantly remind ourselves that just like Laura Bell Gray says, it's an email from a bestie. And she says, what kind of email do you want to open? What kind of post do you want to see? 
So think when you post, think when you email, would I want to open this? Would I want to get this? And then if you don't know what it is that they want, keep asking. I also so, want to add, take yeah. the eye, take the eye out. Like Kathy didn't say, I'm going to teach you how to discover this. Like she instead said, you will learn. Right. So when you right. make it about your customer or the person, like talk to them, like you, this, you, that, not the I, the I, I am this, I am that, you know, so it's always in the service of the people that we're serving. So yeah, yeah. totally. That was all very, very helpful. Um, the book I just held up is called, this is marketing by Seth Godin. I know there's a question in the chat. And then earlier, somebody asked the question about the book that Jackie referenced, which is the year of yes, which is a Shonda Rhimes book. So I want to say thank you. Tell everybody where they can follow the product boss and where they can find you. So it's at the product boss everywhere. Um, you can follow the, the show, subscribe, leave a positive comment, um, or, uh, you know, review, but, um, anywhere you listen to podcasts, we're there and, you know, you can come to the productboss.com, hang out. We've got programs and courses and all the things, especially if you're in product, the product space or wanting to, um, it's retailers, makers, manufacturers, all the things, food companies. So it was such a pleasure. You all are amazing. And Kathy, you create such an amazing like community and group. So I'm just honored to have been a part of it. You're so great. Like you're just the most relatable and yet aspirational person at the same time. It's really fun to be with you and uh, I can't get enough.